Welcome to Elevate, the masterclass where we dissect the elements of exceptional achievement and lifestyle design with a focus on personal growth and real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Tyler Chesser. Elevate Nation, welcome back. This is Tyler Chesser. I'm so thankful to have you here and I am blessed and grateful. I'm excited. I'm jazzed. I'm, I'm amped up. What am I talking about? I'm jazzed. Who says that anymore? What is this, 1982? Uh, I'm excited. I think today's a big day, a really fun day. It's a beautiful day outside where I'm at. So that always helps. But you know what? We get to choose our perspective, and I'm choosing to be amped. And I don't even have to choose that because today's a big day. Jay Papazon is on the podcast today. If you've read The One Thing, if you've read The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, if you've read The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, I mean, the guy, you know, co-authored these books uh, with the man, the myth, the legend, Gary Keller, the founder uh, of Keller Williams, you know, worldwide, one of the, maybe the biggest real estate company in the world. And uh, Jay Papazon is, you know, he's, he's the man behind the scenes here. And uh, what a genius, what an amazing guy, what a great guy. And we've got some magic coming to you today. So, you know what? I'm here. I'm ready to rock. And uh, I got to ask you the question that I always ask. Are you ready to take it to another level? Today is that day. It always is that day, but you know, today really is. And I want to welcome you back to the show where we sit down for mind-expanding conversations with influential authorities in real estate as well as top experts in other industries and disciplines. This is for leaders, entrepreneurs, real estate investors who have a burning desire for the extraordinary. That's the key part right there. If you have a burning desire for the extraordinary, this is the show for you. I know I do, and I know our guests do, and especially Jay. Uh, so super excited about that. It is our mission to identify and apply how the best of the best raise the bar personally and professionally to achieve greatness in real estate and beyond. We will distill the mindset, the habits, the routines, the systems, the strategies, the tools. Did I already say tools? I don't know what's going on with me. I'm saying jazzed. I, you know, I got, I got some things happening today. Uh, for those, this is for those who are elevating to a life without limits so that you can do the same or even more for yourself, right? There is no limits uh, in our life, you know, even though most people want to say that there is, you know, most of us come up and, and, and grow up and believe that, you know, there are limits on our future based on, you know, our environment, our upbringing, you know, the news, you know, things that we read, things that we see, or other people that we've spent time with, you know, a lot of people, we, you know, limiting beliefs, you know, we all, a lot of us have them, right? So it's about being conscious of what those are, and elevating beyond that, right? It's about empowering, you know, yourself with an empowering belief system, right? It's about being conscious of what beliefs do you, you know, that serve you, what beliefs limit you, and, you know, being conscious about that entire process, I think is extremely powerful, extremely exciting. So I love doing this show because it expands our mind, right? It expands possibilities in the future because it all starts there. It's like, what do you believe? What do you believe is possible? And uh, this is a masterclass for leaders and those looking to achieve uncommon results and purposeful outcomes through real estate investing, through personal growth, through other ventures, um, most importantly, and ultimately in their lives. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe. Give us a, uh, you know, give us a subscribe. All you got to do is click the button. We come up with two shows every single week. You know, we talk about personal growth. We talk about real estate investing. Uh, we talk about what's going on between those beautiful ears, um, you know, so that we can learn more about expanding our future, evolving, transforming. And uh, if you're enjoying the show, we would be grateful if you subscribed. If you gave us a five-star rating, a review, it helps us, but also, um, you know, it's, it's a way for you to give back as well. We, we certainly appreciate that. It, it warms my heart, you know, as corny as that sounds, you know, it's not as corny as saying jazzed, I'm jazzed up, but it also does warm my heart. I know it's corny. I don't care. Maybe I am just a corny guy. Uh, but, you know, we, we certainly are grateful if you do subscribe, if you give us a rating and review. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for everyone for being here. I say I'm blessed and grateful to be here. I'm blessed and grateful to have you listening because I know your time and attention is valuable. It's limited. So just want to extend that grat gratitude. Uh, also want to encourage you to share this episode with a friend um, and share this podcast with a friend. You know, are you enjoying the show? Then pay the fee. You know, the fee is literally, it doesn't cost you anything. All it costs you is, hey, just share this with someone else. If you're getting value from the show, 
the way that we grow is through referrals, right? Through introductions. And um, if we're providing value to you, we'd be grateful uh, if you did that uh, for us. And if you've already shared this with someone, thank you. Um, do it one more time. Do it every single time you listen to an episode that you really enjoy and let them know what are you getting from this? You know, you can just share it. Just say, hey, I just recommend you listen to this. Just, to, just take a listen. And uh, that would be amazing. Again, it's 100% free otherwise. Uh, you can also check out elevatepod.com. That's where all the resources are. I talk about this all the time. By the way, uh, just FYI, we are launching Elevate Coaching Academy, right? Elevate High Performance Coaching Academy. So if you want to expand your future, if you're ready to take it to the next level and beyond, this is for you, right? You want to be financially free. You want to be, you know, geographically free. You want to choose the way you're spending your time. You want to choose the way you're impacting the world, impacting others and leaving a legacy. You know, if you want to choose, you know, all of these things, if you want to choose, you know, up leveling your relationships, then, you know, look into this. Uh, we'd love to have you elevate high performance coaching Academy. I am collaborating with Trevor McGregor, the man, the myth, the legend, the world famous, you know, high performance coach. He and myself are collaborating on this eight week program where you get to come in in this immersive, intensive, really what we call decades into days experience where you can transform everything. You can transform your future. So if you're looking to go deeper, we'd love to have you. And uh, you can learn more about that at elevatecoachingacademy.com. We are super excited about that. And uh, it is absolutely going to be transformational uh, for everyone involved. So we'd be grateful. I'd be grateful to, to meet you and to have the opportunity to work with you. Uh, through Elevate High Performance Coaching Academy. Uh, so again, Elevate High Performance, uh, elevatecoachingacademy.com. Okay, guys, I will stop all this intro stuff because it is time. It is absolutely time to introduce you to Jay Papazan. And if you are watching on YouTube, you see a couple of his books. Uh, where are we at? Right behind my right shoulder here, your left, my right. The One Thing, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, these are two absolutely phenomenal books, but he's written more and he's collaborated with some of the greatest people in the real estate business, but he is a best-selling author who serves as the vice president of learning for Keller Williams Realty International, the world's largest real estate company. Okay. All right. There we go. We're confirming it is the largest real estate company in the world. That is amazing. He is also the vice president of Keller NK and the co-owner alongside his wife, Wendy, of Papazan Properties Group with Keller Williams Realty in the beautiful and the amazing Austin, Texas. Jay was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee after attending the University of Memphis, and he spent several years working in Paris. He later graduated from New York University's graduate writing program and began publishing his publishing career at HarperCollins Publishers. There, he helped piece together best-selling books such as Body for Life by Bill Phillips and Go for the Goal by Mia Hamm. And after moving to Austin, Jay joined Keller Williams Realty International. And in 2003, he co-authored The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, a million copy bestseller alongside Gary Williams and Dave Jinks. His most recent work with Gary Keller on The One Thing has sold over 2 million copies worldwide and garnered more than 500 appearances on national bestseller lists, including number one on the Wall Street Journal's hardcover business list. It has been translated into 39 different languages. And I can tell you, that book is absolutely transformative. Many of our guests have said, hey, one of the most impactful books I've read is The One Thing. Let me just tell you, uh, it is absolutely a pleasure and honor and a privilege to be sitting down with Jay Papazan today. So I invite you to enjoy this conversation. Jay, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Tyler. Well, it's my pleasure and it's absolutely a privilege to have you here. And you know, one thing that I always am curious about, especially when, you know, you you learn of someone, you know, from a public image perspective, you know, hey, you wrote you wrote a few books and you've partnered with with folks, but I'd like to know who is Jay Papazan as a man? Like who are you behind the bio? Sure, sure. Um it's kind of what you get is what you see. I'm I'm fundamentally always been very bookish. So like the theme of my life is my nose was in a book. Um, I started writing a little bit when I was in high school. I thought fiction was the path. Um, I, some of my college jobs were in bookstores. 
I was an English major. Like, so there's the theme of letters and words, and that's just a place where I'm, I've been comfortable being creative. And over time, I went from being a book editor. Um, when I moved to Austin with my wife, I got a chance to be a book writer with Gary Keller. And that's been a really fun journey. So like fundamentally, like I'm kind of an introvert who really likes to learn about things. I'm very intensely curious. Um, my, my core values, um, which I've gotten clearer and clearer about the older I get, that first and foremost, I mean, it's very cheesy kind of, but family. Um, I, I think that part of my job every day is to be the best husband and father I can be. And that little metric, like the thought of losing at either one of those is what makes me work harder and do the research when I don't want any. It's like, it, it's, it's just what motivates me. It's something that makes me tick, but I want to make an impact and I want to create abundance. And the more I've dated those words, I'm not ready for a tattoo yet. It's been five years, but the more I date those words, the clearer I get about how they become a compass for how I behave. But, um, like my happiest days are days where I've spent time trying to see a pattern. You know, I'm like, I think of it as kind of problem solving and pattern recognition. Like what do all these successful people have in common and try to articulate that in a simple way. And I'll come home and my poor kids, you know, like, uh, we were driving through Yellowstone. My wife's a realtor. So she's got a big, big real estate business. And have you ever been to Yellowstone Park? You know, I was just at um, uh, Glacier National Park uh, just two months ago, but I have not been to Yellowstone. Well, it's going to be similar because I've been to both. But like to get between point A and point B, you might be driving for two hours in the park. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of driving, oh, yeah. like it's big country. And so we played a lot of word games and one of them uh, was Would You Rather? And so my son was like, a, I don't know, like 11 at that time or maybe 12. But he said, would you rather be trapped in an elevator with mom talking to her clients or dad talking about his book? <laughs> and that kind of sums it up, right? And we all just laugh because that's like a hard choice, you know, because she's always on the phone talking real estate. And I'm always nerding out about this book or research thing. So that's a lot of who I am. I guess the only thing that would not be covered there is I love the outdoors. Um, I like to hunt and fish and be outside alone <laughs> often that's where i get my energy and um, i love movies um, movies and fiction are places where i can turn my work brain off completely and just relax and so i do a lot of that when i can no that's important and i just love you know if when i kind of think about your response there i really love how there's just such a depth of self-awareness like, you know who you are, right? And a lot of people, you know, you ask that question and perhaps it's like, well, you know, I am this and I do this in my career and I am this, but you just described yourself as, hey, I'm an introvert and I get my energy from, you know, hey, I get my energy from being alone. But I also really resonated with, you know, I'm an extrovert, but I would also consider myself in some ways an introverted extrovert. So I know that that sounds like a weird There's the thing called an ambervert, you know, that's right between. Is that right? Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually, you have extrovert, ambivert, introvert. There's a spectrum. And well, maybe I'm on that. I, I'd like to know more about that. And the reason why I say that is because I'm kind of bookish myself and I enjoy learning and reading. And I'm intensely curious myself, like you. But also, yeah. I get energy from being around interesting people. Like when I have a conversation with someone like you and I learn something new. I'm like, oh, that get, that fills me up. And I love that. And so, but also I can be in a big party and have a great time. So tell me a more, tell me more about that because I don't know about any, anything about this. Okay, so um, the first place I read about it um, was I'm thinking Selling is Human. And I'm trying to think of the author's name. Um, he wrote a bunch of books that are on my shelf. Oh gosh, well, Selling is Human by Daniel Pink. Mm, yes. And mm -hmm. he shared some research that extroverts actually don't make the best salespeople or the best leaders. And that led me down um, the path. There's a great, great book called Quiet by Susan Cain. I have it. I haven't read it yet. So it's like right up there, like in terms of books that are highly researched, but wonderful reading and you get actual practical takeaways, Quiet and Grit are like in the same place on my bookshelf. Angela Duckworth really opened my eyes to perseverance and resilience and why that's important and how it happens. Quiet is all about the kind of the secret powers of introverts. And she talks about the spectrum and, you know, 
if you're in the middle, you can flex. Um, what I like to tell people about introverts, though, is they it's not that introverts are misanthropes. We don't dislike people. We just don't need them. Mm. So my wife is an extrovert. She gets energy from being around people and a lot of them. I'm an introvert. And so I get energy from alone time and thinking time. And where we meet in the middle is usually one-on-one -on -one small group settings. We both get a charge out of it. If I'm talking, I have a great meeting with someone just like you. I'm like bouncing off the walls because with one person, you tend to go deeper. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the essence of it for me. So um, I would say go out and, and listen to the audiobook or read quiet. I think that is the a really great analysis of that spectrum. Um, I'm also friends with a woman named uh, Vanessa Van Edwards. She wrote a great book called Captivate, which is the science of people, which goes into this too. So because I'm an introvert and have to do a lot of extroverted things, <laughs> I've gone down that well just a little bit. Um, you saw me go off camera. Yes. And there's this little tiny book by the Harvard Business Review called Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker. Do you know that? I do. I've read it. Yeah, it's like a book. little essay. But like the takeaway for me from this, and it came very late in life, of so much of my true self-awareness came in my mid forties. I'm just being completely honest. You know, I had to become a parent and realize that in order to be a great husband and a great father, I had to know, be, be a little bit more self-aware, right. In order to, to lead, not just myself, but others. And that's led to better business breakthroughs true. But that is one of the things he talks about is he talks about kind of journaling at the end of the day, what did you do well? And what did you enjoy, do, enjoy doing? And if you just pay attention for a short period of time, the patterns do kind of leap up, you know, like the days that I'm proud of and I come home fulfilled and full of energy, like there is a pattern to those days. And there are mm -hmm. days when you come home and you're grumpy and you kick the cat and you snap at the kids and you slam the dishes in the sink. And those are not your best days. And they're really a product of how we spend our time or in, I would rather say how we, how good, how well or poorly we invested our time. Hey guys, just a quick word from our sponsor and we'll be right back to the show. This episode of Elevate is brought to you by CF Capital and you know how much I love real estate and how it can be a vehicle towards creating any outcome that you want in your life, which is really why we created CF Capital, a real estate investment firm that focuses on acquiring and operating multifamily assets that provide stable cash flow, capital appreciation, and a margin of safety for our investors, for our partners, and for the people that we serve. Our team leverages its expertise in acquisitions and management to provide investors like you with superior risk-adjusted returns while placing a premium on preserving capital. Our mission is to provide property investment and asset management solutions to help investors maximize their returns by investing in high-value multifamily communities. Our philosophy is that we can elevate communities together through this process. And I wanna invite you to go check out cfcapllc.com because we have a free ebook that's called The Bottom Line, The 10 Ways to Increase Cash Flow in an Apartment Complex. And I wanna tell you that this is a value-packed ebook. So I wanna to, want to invite you to go check that out right now at cfcapllc.com. I think you're gonna get a ton of value just from reading this, whether you apply it to your own business or whether you educate yourself further on what it would look like if you invested with CF Capital. So go check that out at cfcapllc.com. Again, that's cfcapllc.com and enjoy the rest of the show. That's super powerful. Um, I love that. And one thing I think of is, is you know, as it relates to self-awareness, you know, that's something that it's kind of a journey in itself, right? And you just even yeah. described like later in your life was when you really started to become so much more aware. But when you started to make those shifts, I mean, what did you see in terms of a transformation of your life? Why was that important for you? Um, when you can actually see what makes you tick, when you're aware of the values that drive your decisions. I think a lot of us make decisions and we regret them or we're happy with them afterwards. But just taking a little bit of time over time to see if there's a pattern and try to get some sort of shorthand for why that is the way it is, right? To know thyself just a little bit. It doesn't have to have like, it doesn't need to be a dossier <laughs> where you've broken all these things down. But if you're willing to be curious you can see not only where your strengths are, but where your weaknesses are. And just have to be honest. Like, I think that um, you don't have to make all of your weaknesses into strengths. I think that's not normal. Um, I, think, I think if you have really outsized talent somewhere that you develop, and that takes a lot of time. That means you're gonna have gaps. 
I remember reading Sherlock Holmes. I was a, an addict on all things Sherlock Holmes. And there's this passage in one of them where he doesn't even understand truly that the earth, uh, how the earth moves around the sun or the sun moves around the earth. Like he doesn't understand and he doesn't care because it doesn't apply to criminal science. Hmm. And, you know, the Dr. Watson is incredulous. Like, how can you not know how the solar system works? And he's like, I've never thought of, I don't care about it basically. But that was like an aha moment. It's like, if you invest the time to be good at something that necessarily is gonna create a gap somewhere else. And like, I love my wife for all of her wonderful qualities. And I can also know that she is an imperfect creature. And I guarantee you, she could say the same about me. That doesn't make us like lovable or unlovable. It just means we're human. So like that exploration, if we can get beyond judgment and just into understanding, man, we start to make such better decisions about how we invest our time, who we hang out with, right? Those are big decisions that we take for granted unless we've done a little bit of this analysis. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that I love about having this conversation with you is just your intense curiosity in so many different directions that really focused on, you know, improvement, right? Self-improvement, but also your intense curiosity with, you know, patterns, you know, not only within yourself, but within other people, perhaps successful people. One of the things we talk about here is that we, you know, this show is for people who have a desire or burning desire to be extraordinary, right? Yeah. And, you know, you have to observe those patterns and apply, right? Identify and apply what works for you, and then perhaps make some adjustments. But, you know, if you had to look at, you know, some of the top patterns, maybe it's the top two or three patterns that you've observed in the most successful that either you've collaborated with or that you've studied over the years, what would those be? Can I cheat on you here a little bit and talk yes. about what those patterns are? Oh, yeah. So it, it, this is a language I get um, for the last 20 years, I've gotten to work with Gary Keller. And for 18 of those, we were writing books together. And there are times where we spend a lot of time together, and there are times when we haven't, but there's been a long period of time. And one of the hallmarks of why he's a self-made billionaire and has had amazing impact in the world is we call it modeling. I don't have no idea what you have to call it, but what we're looking for is take a big topic like money. You can read all of these books and there's a lot of conflicting information. Because the reality is there is more than one way to skin a proverbial cat. But if you look under, there's usually a pattern of commonality between the people who do something exceptionally well, right? The gold medalist. And I hate that I used the now it was skin a cat. Like who's going to sell a cat? That's like an old thing that we don't even know what it means anymore. Who skins cats, right? Nobody I know, skins I know. cats. Where does that even come from? <laughs> um, but the, the idea would be is if you thought you might want to climb Mount Everest, you would go out and you would read the biographies or you would interview, study, you know, nine or 10 of the people who were most successful and look for what they had in common. And often those commonalities, not the things that they uniquely do, which might line up with some unique characteristic they have that you're never going to have, right? There's usually some best practices that apply across a broad group of people. And the thing that Gary's done, and it's so funny, I'll be talking to him like, where did you get this idea? And he'll point to a book. Like literally, we were looking at Psycho Cybernetics from like 1974. Amazing book, amazing book. But incredibly dated, like it's hard to read today, <laughs> but there's some real wisdom there. Sure. And what I realized is here he is fresh out of college from Baylor. He decides that this is the right idea. And in his mind, and today I would use Evernote or a journal, I'd say, okay, this is what I've decided I believe about this part of management or this part of self-image. That was psycho-cybernetic self-image. Mm -hmm. And he created what he thought is like his true statement, his principle, his model, either from multiple people on that, but that then becomes an anchor. When someone says, what do you think about self-image? He goes all the way back to 1974, references that, but over time, He's always willing to top grade it. And I, I can tell you over 20 years, I've watched him just say, nope, this is not a better idea. Or you know what? We need to add to this idea. And the ideas build on each other. And so like that process, when you talk about excellence and patterns, to me, that's the process. I'm not just reading books to get new ideas. That leads to what I call fad surfing. It's not my phrase. Someone else said it, but I, I love it. Because I know a lot of people that are self-improvement junkies, 
that are always doing some new challenge. I'm intermittent fasting and now I'm doing this and now I'm doing the meat only diet because I heard about it on a podcast. And the problem with those is that you're kind of jumping from one thing to the other. And there's this thing that happens over time where you build momentum around doing something extraordinarily well and refining it and refining it for you. So I kind of think that we should be a lot slower to adopt patterns of behavior, a lot more skeptical on the front end and once we've adopted it, we need to have a test in order to change it and just say, wow, is this really a better idea or is this just different? Because in my experience, like one of the things all these successful people keep telling me, 99% of success is just making peace with boredom. Mm. There's so many repetitive things that they just had to keep doing and keep doing well that add up to so much more than any individual day of doing it because they were consistent while everybody else was running around doing different stuff or new stuff. They build up massive talent and momentum around a few core fundamentals that just matter so much more than all of the sexy stuff that shows up. So I hope I didn't just torpedo like any of your big ideas, but my mentor, that's where he comes from. And like, I literally have like an Evernote file of my principles, like, okay, how do I think that contracts should work in partnerships? And as I learn, I add to that either your mental Rolodex, if you're smarter than me, I have to write it down. You know, I learned a new lesson. And now the next time I'm doing a partnership agreement, I'm going to go back and say, what are the lessons I've learned so far? So I don't repeat those mistakes. I can at least get better and better. Man, that is so powerful. And, you know, there's just so much to really distill there. But what you're basically talking about is modeling best practices but then not always being willing to just like jump in on some new, I love that. I've never heard that fad surfing, but it really resonates with me because I surround myself with a lot of the folks who are, you know, kind of in that world in some ways. And it's like, wait a minute, do we have to accept every new idea and just adopt it immediately? No. And it come, it kind of gives me the, it reminds me of the quote or the philosophy of, you know, those who are successful change slowly, but then when they, you know, when they change, they're all in, right. They're yes. all committed. Exactly. Gary said something that very similar, like me and uh, Jeff, who is my partner on the One Thing podcast, and we built a training company around the book. And um, I'm in the middle. Like, I, I love to research, but I'm also, I, I'll take risk. I'll to go and take action. And Jeff is very much like, I'm going to go do. Like, I'm, mm -hmm. he's a very active doer, and he's very good at executing. And Gary was really making us wait to make a decision. And he just said, I'm going to invest however much time it takes for me to feel like we've made the right decision. And there's no such thing as a hundred percent. Like he's not going analysis because, but I guarantee you once I've decided you'll have trouble keeping up. Hmm. But he just said, I refuse to just because I'm impatient to choose. I'm not going to choose because there's a clock ticking. My deadlines are my deadlines. This is my life. I'm going to live the best one I can. So I'm going to give myself the time to make an incredible decision around things that are really important to me, not everything. It's not like I'm going to spend 20 days picking the next show I'm going to stream on Netflix. That's ridiculous, right? right. But I'm going to, this is about investing. So I kind of think of it as a difference between being Warren Buffett and a day trader. Mm -hmm. There are day traders who are successful, but they're having to learn something new all the time. And the beauty of his success is he learned a couple of really key principles and he's just used time as his greatest weapon. Um, Morgan Housel, he wrote a great book called The Psychology of Money that just came out this year. Fantastic mm -hmm. read. He shared with me, I didn't know this, that of the, I don't know, $85 billion that Warren Buffett has earned to make him the world's best investor. Um, one, he started investing when he's 10. And all but $4 billion of that he earned after age 65. Hmm. So like the secret of his success is he had one strategy and he just kept doggedly plowing and it was a good one. Like he was a millionaire by he was 30, but he kept doing it and he kept doing it and he refused to quit. Like Apple just recently was the first tech stock he ever allowed himself to buy. He sat on the sidelines during the tech bubble because he didn't understand it. He's like, I do things like Coca-Cola. I do things like trains and banks. So I would rather for, for my habits be Warren Buffett than a day trader doesn't mean that day traders won't succeed. I just like the lifestyle. And I think I like the idea of becoming a master of something more than just doing a lot of new things. 
Yeah, and I want to get to habits because I think that's really important. But before we get there, let's talk a little bit more about principles because what you're kind of really alluding to, at least with it, from my my perspective about Warren Buffett, is you're talking about principles, right? Yeah. The long term success of his compounded efforts were based on decisions that he made a long time ago, right? And you even mentioned that you you house your principles within Evernote, and I love using that type of tool. Have but you read Ray Dalio? I have. I have. Right. So like that's, I love the word. That takes me right there. I mean, me he too. lives this too. Yeah. And he was very clear about his investor principles and he wrote them out. Um, and I thought the first half of that book was fabulous. It was a love song to this idea of mm -hmm. figure out the formula, write it down and follow the formula until you have to change it. Mm, that's good. So t what would you tell your younger self about developing your personal and professional principles? If you had to look back, whether it's investing, whether it's how you act in business, or just how you treat other people, how you act on a daily basis, is there anything that comes to mind about what um, you would tell your younger self? The first thing that comes to mind, which is often closest to the truth, <laughs> um, is no one succeeds alone. And that's a phrase that we have in our workplace, right? It's kind of a mantra. Uh, but definitely as an introvert, um, my tendency is to kind of go into my cave and figure things out. But everything that's been truly transformative that I've been a part of is involved other people. And when I look at the world, I realize that the things that truly make an impact, and that's important to me, right? Making an impact have been the product of teams. And so I think I waited till very late in life to la start learning the habits and skills and disciplines, right, around leadership. Um, Self-leadership is the basis of all great leadership, I believe, but there is a journey you're on. You can be the world's best widget maker, but to teach people and lead people to make widgets is a whole other art form that you have to learn. You're back to grade one, you're in kindergarten when you start that, and you have to go through the painful journey of mastering those things. And I, I, I waited painfully late to start learning and appreciating those skills, um, which are really about business and leadership skills. This is amazing because, you know, you talked about mastering self-leadership, you know, prior to, you know, being a foundation of stepping into more of a leadership role, which I love that. And I think that it's extremely important for us to note that, you know, if you're going to be a real estate investor, if you're going to be a successful real estate investor, real estate professional, any type of business, you know, sort of practitioner, it's never going to be, you know, a one man show, right? It's going to be a team sport, right? If you want to do real things, if you want to create real outcomes in your life, if you want to create a lifestyle by design, especially, it's going to be about leading other people, right? About communicating and, and first leading yourself and also course correcting along the way. So you talked, you touched a little bit about habits and skills of, mm -hmm. you know, exceptional leaders. I mean, what would you point to, you know, what are the, what are the top habits and, and, and skills of the most exceptional leaders that you've observed? Um, I want to correct one thing that I might've left in a listener. I don't think that you have to win in the NBA as a player to qualify to be a coach, mm. but I do think that you have to have been on some form of that journey to truly understand the issues so that you can lead them. It doesn't always show up that way, but I, I'm choosing to try to to lead, show that I can, I'm willing to do the hard work, just like I'm asking you to do. And I may not get the same success rate that you because you're the NBA player and I'm not, but I can master these other ones. So there's a concentricity around that. When I talk about self-leadership, it doesn't mean that you actually have to become exceptional at these things to lead people who are, but you have to be willing to try and fail a lot of those things for them to look at you and think that you're valid. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you're kind of a phony, right? right. I'm going to do like you, you tell your kids, you know, don't do as I do, do as I say. And that's just horrible for leadership. They need to see that you're trying to do the things that you're asking them to do, even if you're failing. That's my personal philosophy. So the, the habits of leadership, the, the things that I do now that I didn't do then, I was not methodical about building a database. And um, I got to meet, I can't remember the, the guy who wrote Go, the Swim with the Sharks book. But he, Harvey McKay, maybe, I think is his name, but he just said, you know, if you use your brain for a database, you've got a really poor database. And being systematic around identifying relationships that matter and following up and building relationships is incredibly important in business and life. And um, I'm the kind of friend that traditionally love people from a distance. Like I loved it when I reconnected, but like I, it wasn't in my repertoire of natural activities to think to pick up the phone and call. Right. 
right? I was always the person that other people called. And um, I actually had to go to a funeral where I heard a brother eulogizing his brother and saying that his regret was that he was that person and he wasn't, hadn't been calling his brother the person that mattered the most. And I remember sitting in the audience going, oh crap, that's me. And I could be eulogizing my mom, my sister, my best friend, and they're the ones who always called me. Mm. And so it was about a choice not to live with regret that I realized I needed to build systems in my life where I could be methodical about identifying the relationships that matter most to me and being methodical about building those relationships. And it sounds like programmatic, but a classic CRM, like a sales CRM will nudge you and say, hey, it's time to call Tyler. You haven't talked to him in six months. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I made a goal to build a database and add at least 50 people a year that were in some way exceptional. And I've been doing that for almost seven years now. And that's a really slow, I'm an introvert, one person a week. That's really low bar. My wife laughs at me because she's a realtor. She's like meeting people all the time. <laughs> but I just wanted to earn the right to get in relationship with someone and earn the right to follow up. And now I do like a monthly newsletter to those people that I've added. Mm -hmm. Like I have a system that works for my personality. I, I, I could say I'm going to call them four times a year, but I won't. But I can put them all on an email list that they, they hear from me at least once a month. And then they have an invitation to write back. So I just call it getting purposeful around something I now realize is really important. And I've launched two businesses from those relationships. I've hired dozens of employees for my wife's businesses and mine, because even though I wasn't saying I'm only going to meet with people I'm going to hire, it's very open. I just want to meet with someone who's really good at what they do. And I can say, Tyler, I've heard you're really good at podcasting. Can I take you to coffee? And people are like, really? That's nice. And so my coffee date, my weekly coffee date became a kind of platform. You know this, you're on a podcast. It doesn't matter if you have two listeners. People are like, sure, you can interview me. And they're kind of flattered. It's a platform and it's an attractor. It's a reason for asking. So I would just say, um, whatever you do as an investor, as a business person, as a leader, as a leader of yourself, you won't probably do as much as you could alone. So you might as well get purposeful about building a system for managing the, the important relationships and adding new ones. Yes. And you know what this makes me think of is literally the book, your book, The One Thing, right? Because what you're talking about is focusing on the one thing that makes everything else either easier or irrelevant when you come when it comes to relationships, right? Especially in the real estate business, it's all about relationships. So that's one thing you can focus on. Is that kind of how you view it? It's like your point of leverage? That it is. I was, um, this, this program came out when we first launched the book and I got a sense that it might be big. And I have a coach. I've had coaches um, for the last 10 years. Once a week, I get on the phone and I share where I'm going. And they ask me really uncomfortable questions about what I am or am not doing, right? But I remember my coach saying, Jay, you have multiple businesses. Um, your book is taking off. Um, you can't have 10 one things. Mm. It's one thing for you to own a business, but you can only be the CEO of one of them. So what is an activity? This is very much in the one thing. What is one activity that you could start doing that would serve all of them? Just ask me to go level up. Like I've got a portfolio of businesses and opportunities that's growing. How could I serve all of them? And I was like, well, like you're a podcaster. I, I was a writer. I was like, when you say I write books, I would like to chat with you. People perk up and they say yes, that would never say yes. So I felt like I had an unfair advantage to get a door opener, a foot in the door. And that's where that idea got concocted. And it started with a meeting, just one person a week. And it was a drudgery in the beginning. And the first year I did exactly 50 and quit one a week and I gave myself two weeks off. And the next year to my surprise, I did 79 and then I did 129. And then I had to start creating no's. Like I had to create barriers because the people I'd met started referring me to other people. And it built it like, just like we talked about in the book, there was this momentum that comes from doing something over time that made it easier and more impactful. And then that same coach came back, like it was like 24 months later, like two years into it, said, how's that going? I, I can see that your numbers are good. And then he asked the uncomfortable question. Now, what's the next domino? What are you doing to stay in touch with them? And my rationale was, well, they all call me, right? They call me, I was still in that mode. And he says, no. 
what is now, now that you've built this habit, what's something that you can do? And that's where I came up with my idea just for a very personal, very private newsletter with people I had connected with. And my open rate's close to 50%. So it's not like a spam. It's just me talking about what I experienced or thought about the last month. And that's my way. And the last thing I say is, and reply back and tell me what you're up to. So that actually went out this morning and I've got about 50 emails waiting for me to interact with those people. It's just like a system that one builds the database and allows me to communicate with it. And because they, they're clearly reading it, like I have a chance to reach out and say, Tyler, hey, I wanted to check in with you. And they'll say something like, hey, I read your newsletter last month. Congrats, your daughter learned Japanese. That's cool, like whatever that is. So that's like, this is the introverts method. So the bar is low across the board. But it, what it represents is not the answer. That was my answer. Mm -hmm. So your answer might be very different, but you should ask for something that can become a habit, right? Every Wednesday, I have a coffee meeting. COVID made it virtual. Who cares? But I have a ritual that people now know about and I can live. And once a month, I do the newsletter. Mm. Well, you know, it, it reminds me of the the theory or the philosophy that perhaps, you know, the, the more successful you get, the more challenged it becomes to how you're going to spend your time, your effort, your energy. And so that's why I, f I find the philosophy of the one thing to be so important and yeah. for people to really eliminate so many different decisions. You know, people talk about, hey, well, I, I can multitask. I can do this, that, and the other. And we all know that multitasking is, is you know, it's not going to happen. It's a myth, Right. But what you're talking about is about thinking bigger, right? About thinking across the landscape of your life, of you know the way that you operate across different you know businesses or what have you. So, what would you suggest to someone who says, "Well, I get it, the one thing, but how do I decide what is my one thing?" I mean, what would you suggest to folks? So, um, it's a great question. The starting point is usually asking the question. You have to give it a framework. So, um, the only page I have memorized in our book is page one fourteen. And it's got seven circles and it's the seven circles of your life that you could apply this approach. And we say that you could apply it to your spiritual life, your physical health, your personal life, your key relationships, your job, your business, and your money. And I'm sure other people might have other areas that are really important to them, but we just tried to identify what was in common for me and Gary. And so I usually will ask people to say, if you had to pick an area, you can't build habits in all of them. But if you had to pick an area of your life that you really want to improve, either because you're feeling pain around it, like I'm overweight, I really know I've got to fix this thing, or we're in debt and we're getting farther in debt and I need to fix that thing, um, or I'm really good at podcasting, but I've got to level up, right? It can be either one. You just need to choose. So then ask the question, you said it earlier, what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else would be easier or unnecessary for that thing? And in my experience, you know, Tyler, we, we took us four and a half years to write the book. And uh, we were very slow about it. And we did a lot of research and we really questioned our thinking. And I can tell you, I was up at night staring at the ceiling, wondering, and I believed in the question. I was afraid most people would not know their answers. Mm. And in my experience, and I've literally taught this to tens of thousands of people, the vast majority of people know their answer they just either haven't stopped to ask the question, they're too busy and too consumed with all the things they think they have to do, or they don't trust their answer and they want someone else to validate it. So I would just tell them, ask the question, go ahead and trust your answer and then ask, what would be the smallest possible domino I could start building a habit around in that? And by that, I mean, if you think that you need to start meditating to lower your heart rate and stress levels, don't start by doing two hours a day. Literally, you might start by just building the habit of meditating first thing in the morning when you get out of bed for five minutes and count that as a victory and build on the momentum of, man, I'm doing it. I'm not very good, but I'm doing it. I'm not very good, but I'm doing it. And one day you'll look up and you'll be better at it and you'll do it for longer. Most people are way too impatient and rush to like the 18th domino and it's too big and they can do it while they're excited, but then it falls apart. That's why most people's New Year's resolutions just collapse by February because they're way too many behaviors, way too much behavioral change too fast. So Jay, what you're telling me is the one thing, if you don't know what your one thing is, is to ask that question and to sit and literally listen to what 
is the answer here. You know, you're going to, you're going to come up with one thing for the book. We were, I mean, we put it on the back, a big question mark that if there was only one outcome from the book is that people might ask that question because we believe that they can just identify their priority in whatever Mm -hmm. it is that was important to them. They were so much more likely to do it. And if they're doing their priority, that makes them incredibly productive. Right? Just if we're actually knocking out the things that matter, by default, we're being very productive. It's not about how many things we can check off. It's about the thing that matters that we checked off. Well, one of my philosophies, and I know it's yours as well, is that high quality questions get you high quality answers, right? If oh, you want, totally. if you want to influence yourself or other people, it's about asking better questions. And I just love this. And um, you know, one thing I also really like about what you guys do and what you stand for is about questioning your thinking. You were talking about, hey, it took us four and a half years to write the book. I kind of like that too because it wasn't just rushed out; it was considered, it was challenged, and all these things. It seems like that's a habit of yours as well. It's just challenging your own thinking. How else do you do that? I mean, you surround yourself yourself with people who maybe play the devil's advocate uh, with you or how else do you do that? Um, I, I do that a little bit naturally. I'm a little OCD. So that's in my back pocket that I kind of want, when I decide to do something, I do kind of get a little crazy about it. Um, and that's just in my nature. So that's cheat, right? That's a cheat. That's something that I may be doing naturally that everybody else can't do. Uh, ultimately though, when I look at the first 30 years of my life before I met Gary, I had some really good outcomes. But the quality of my outcomes since I was working with him are much better because as a partner, as an accountability partner, as someone who was on the same journey, he was willing to test and ask harder questions. So the first book I wrote actually with him was with him and another partner, a really brilliant guy named Dave Jenks. And we wrote a book in 90 days that's gone on to sell 1.4 million copies. It's a real estate guide for real estate agents. And... I remember that writing process. Um, We all um, were aggressive thinkers and we were willing and we trusted each other to argue with each other. And we called it, um, Gary dubbed it or Dave did, it's a high clash of ideas, low clash of egos. So it wasn't about who won the argument. It was about identifying the argument that won. And so I was trying to explain it to my wife because we would literally just fight for hours over a paragraph. And I just said, because we had that partnership, it kind of formed a crucible that the ideas that emerged and lived on mostly were pretty strong ideas, right? So who is that person? Like, I mean, I think of, you can have a mentor, you can have a partner, like a friend, a spouse that can be that for you. If you don't even have it, you can hire a coach. I mean, I ended up having a partner that was excruciating in that, Gary Keller, Like he is going to ask the tough question. He doesn't say, is that the best you can do? He says, is that the best that can be done? Mm. Which is a tough thing for someone to ask you because I'm prepared to say I gave it my best, but he wants to know that I gave it my best and I approached it in the best possible way, which is a very different question. So I've got that, but I still hired a coach because it's good to have someone completely outside of my life to ask the question, Tyler, how are you approaching this? And to see it with fresh eyes. So I don't know. I relied on others and other people can rely on others to keep them honest, really. Mm -hmm. What a powerful shift of a question of, hey, is that the best you can do? Or is that the best that can be done? My goodness, that is a freaking just bomb that you just dropped on us right there. That is insane. It's a bomb when it gets dropped on you and you're showing up (laughs) with your work in hand too. Well, I mean, you know. I'll be back next week. You know what? This is not really ready yet. I'll be back. It's like, actually, I'm glad you asked that because I also asked myself that on the way in and I decided that, you know, (laughs) but that's so good. And we could all ask ourselves that question, right? Well, that is, um, we talked about this at the beginning of our conversation, this idea of modeling. That's what we call it. Mm -hmm. Um, If it truly matters to you um, and the things that matter to me is like, I do want to impact people with my writing and my teaching. I do want to be a great husband and a great father. And there are a few other things that also matter, right? Uh, but it's not a million things. And for those things that matter, it's worth asking that question, Mm -hmm. right? Am I just doing my best or am I taking the best approach and then giving my best? Because did you ever play golf? Yes, I do. I don't play well, but yeah, I play. Yeah, I suck too, but I can remember (laughs) my dad's a great golfer and um, he got me to take golf lessons. Like this is a game you can play for life, son, whatever. 
And yeah, I yeah. remember going to this municipal golf course with two of my buddies and learning from this guy that would just cuss at us and yell at us because we were so bad. But that feeling of having to hold a golf club right for the first time is completely unnatural. Like I wanted to hold it like a baseball bat, but that's not how you hold a golf club. You have to wrap your fingers over each other and it's very complicated and it feels very unnatural. Sometimes the best way is very unnatural. Mm. But if you don't start and build habits with that, you'll never reach your potential. And that's my metaphor. I wish I could come up with one that didn't involve having to have held a golf club the right way. But that was one of the most uncomfortable things that like, no, there is a model for how to hold a golf club if you want to actually be good at the game. And it's nothing you're going to, there's nothing, I don't even know how that was discovered. Like how the heck did they get to hold the golf club that way? Because it's so unnatural. But ask the question, this matters to me. Is there someone out there who's done this really, really well? I should probably start where they left off before I start getting creative. Hey guys, I just wanted to take a brief time out from this show, this incredibly mind expanding discussion to speak to the high achievers, the high performers. I wanted to speak to those who have a burning desire to go to the next level and beyond. First of all, I hear you and I see you. When I got started as a real estate entrepreneur, fresh out of my W2 corporate job, I was excited and jubilant to create and design my future. At the same time, my business and life was filled with confusion, filled with fear, doubt, uncertainty, and to be honest with you, sometimes even sleepless nights and hopelessness, even while experiencing what many would have considered substantial success. Ultimately, I mustered up the courage to hire one of the world's top high performance business coaches to work directly with me on creating strategies, systems, and profound shifts towards accelerating my multifaceted performance and to become an industry leader. After years of investing significant resources into myself and in my business through this process, I am now paying it forward as a high performance coach to those who feel called to elevate to the extraordinary. Wherever you are right now, you know deep down that you have it within you to be great. If you're someone who's seriously looking to elevate your business, your real estate portfolio, your cash flow, your deal flow, your network, your net worth, your lifestyle, and ultimately your life right now and ongoing for the rest of your life, I have a message for you. Because if that's you, then I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. I have limited coaching spots available to guide people like you who want to substantially close the gap from where you are to where you want to be. These are first come, first serve, and demand high touch, one-to-one -one focus from me directly to you. And this is not for everyone. This is only for those who are decisive, committed, and willing to do whatever it takes. It's only for those willing to play full out and invest time, energy, and resources into themselves to achieve greatness in real estate investing and beyond, which is what we're all about on this podcast. This is for those defiantly inspired for transforming as an empowered limitless and unstoppable human being in full control of their and their business's future. If that is you, I invite you to visit coachwithtyler.com. Again, that's coachwithtyler.com where you can apply for this life-changing opportunity. We will then schedule a discovery session where we will directly discuss what's working, not working, and how we can work together to accelerate your future. With that said, enjoy the rest of the show. Jay, I am really enjoying this conversation and uh, my goodness, we could go, we could go on for like <laughs> hours. Cause this is like, man, this is candy. And you know, I, I, there's so many different things I could, so many different directions I could go with this, but I wanted to at least get this in because I found it to be profound and it's something that I believe deeply, you know, I think you mentioned it in the one thing is that you should have no regrets at the end of the day, that success is an inside job. And if you approach with purpose, with priority and with high productivity, on the priority that matters, the extraordinary becomes possible. So I just wanted to at least just bring that up before we dive into our rapid fire section, but do you have any comments on that piece? There's um, um, one of our signature training courses. We have this idea of be, do, have. And um, this idea that all success starts on the inside, right? We're human beings, not human doing. And so it starts by trying to decide, and you kind of mentioned this earlier, like who do I want to be? And that should determine what I do. And ultimately, like those questions of figuring out later in life, I told you, it took me like 46 years to really get clear about the man I chose to be. And I think my wife figured out the woman she wanted to be a lot earlier than I did. 
but that clarity is a massive tailwind in making great decisions about what you should or shouldn't be doing. So when we say success is an inside to the outside job, it's an inside job. It starts by how you think, and that should lead you to better actions. And then we can talk about efficiency and gripping the golf club. The first question should be, should I even be playing golf? Is that who I want to be? Yes. Um, you know James Clear? Have you interviewed him? I haven't, but I know him, and I love his Atomic Habit book. Fabulous. I, yes. I got to interview him years before he wrote the book and because I was a fan of his blog. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to him about, like, athletic challenges and working out because he's a very fit guy. And I had just done, like, a 100 push-up challenge, and we were talking about how those things kind of kind of be a letdown. And then the thing he said that's almost thematic, he goes – I figured out that if I decided I chose to become the kind of person who went to the gym every day, that running a marathon or doing 100 push-ups would always be within my reach. But if I just did those things, I wouldn't necessarily be the kind of person who went to the gym every day and enjoyed those benefits for life. Mm. So he chose the who he wanted to be, and that led him to the doing. So I love that you highlight that phrase. I think it's very deep. Um, it doesn't feel as practical as it should be, but it's a question everyone should be asking. Yeah, because we vote for ourselves by the activities that we do, that we partake in, right? We are voting for a certain identity in any moment, right? This, this, these are the things that a fit person does, or these are the things that a successful business person does, or a successful investor does, or a, you know, a great father, or a great mother, you know, all of these things. So that's, that's super powerful. Thank you for that share. Jay, oh my goodness, I could go on for hours and hours and hours, but I want to be respectful of your time and dive into our rapid fire section. We call it sure. the rare air questionnaire. It's about being uncommon. It's about making, you know, decisions that at times perhaps feel unnatural, right? And being willing to trust the process if that outcome is what we desire. So, you know, talk to me as, as a reader, as someone who is ever curious, who's bookish, as you mentioned, if you were to point to two or three of the most impactful books that you've read over the past few years, what would those be and why? Um, you know, I grabbed, because I, I left the camera, our little video interview, um, Managing Oneself Made a Difference. I have a stack of books at different times that are impactful. Um, so Managing Oneself by Peter Drucker, super short, but it, there's a couple of key things that this idea of figure out what your strengths are. Um, don't just guess. Don't think. A lot of times, um, like I could go to my wife and say, I think I'm really good at this. And she's like, no, you're not. You think you are, but you're not, right? <laughs> we need to have some honest perspective on our real abilities. Um, have you read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield? I have not. So a lot of my life, I was a serial procrastinator. And I used deadlines as a way to find motivation to focus. And that's ultimately not a recipe for greatness, right? You can't wait till the night before to prepare for a marathon. That worked for your English paper in 11th grade. That doesn't work for a lot of the big things that we try in life. And so he talks about um, a mental battle of battling the resistance. And I think it's a battle that was particularly uh, acute for me, um, resisting starting things, wanting things to be too right. And so it's kind of a, it's meant for writers, but man, I know so many entrepreneurs who put that among their top five books. And I'm going to, I'm going to stop with those two, but give you, um, no, I'm going to stop with those two. Those are two pretty good ones for people to dive into. I don't have a top 10 list. You have to go into topics. Like what are your three favorite marketing books or what are your, Absolutely. Like, cause I tend to read with purpose. Like what are your top 10 money books? And I kind of catalog them that way, not around just my whole life, but these are ones that I tend to give away a lot because I think they're universally helpful. I appreciate you bringing that up. And there was a lot of nuggets of wisdom without even talking about the books. But, you know, Seth Godin was another who brought up the war of art to me on, on Elevate. And, you know, what it makes me think of is that, you know, as entrepreneurs, we are also creatives, right? What are you going to, you know, bring to the world? And so those thinking tools that I would imagine that you gain just by diving into that purposeful reading, that pur purposeful study is extremely powerful. So thank you for that. And thank oh, you I'll for- I'll give you one since you okay. love questions. Here's one. It's a recent one. Have you read The Road Less Stupid by Keith Cunningham? No, I haven't. He's got like the 700 deadly questions in it. Mm. His big thing is thinking time for entrepreneurs. If you don't have any blocks where you're not doing and you get to think and examine and work on your business, like instead of in it, right? Um, and he even supplies questions for that thinking time. So that's just Ooh. like a, for you personally, you might really love that. And he is a brilliant, brilliant entrepreneur. That's awesome. Thank you for that. 
So Jay, outside of our discussion today, what's the biggest way that you elevate your life on a daily basis? Well, I think I hit on it. I think um, every week I look at my goals. We have a process for that. And so they're written down. I happen to, they're in my bookmark in my journal. So um, we talk about having a relationship with our goals in our community. Uh, the world doesn't need another way to set them. We need to have a way to date them and marry them. Hmm. Because it's often, you know, three to four weeks in that um, the shine comes off that and we don't give it as much energy. And so I just reminded myself at the top of my goal sheet, it's not lying. It's just, it's with me wherever I go. I've got my annual goals based on that, what I'm going to do this month. And based on that, what I'm going to do this week, I break them down every week, but at the top are my values. And I just think that if we can have a closer connection to the values we hold dear, that we should never be violating and connect those things to the goals that we said were important we're a lot more likely to have a relationship with our goals and actually achieve them. Yeah, we have to know why, right? What's the what's the reason behind what I'm doing right now? What's the why behind what I'm doing right now? I love that. What's the biggest way that you elevate other people around you, Jay? Um, I love to teach. I love to share. Um, I think when I'm my best days, I was trying to explain this to uh, my EA. Um, as a manager, when I can remember to ask questions, instead of tell the answers. Um, it's been made the best gift I can give my people and my kids. Um, if I can help them discover the right answer, um, then that's their answer. It's not something that they were told and they're so much more likely to live it. So I guess just on a real simple leadership skills level, um, when I can remember to not tell and be the smart guy on a white horse, which is really attractive on some days, I wanna come <laughs> riding in and save the day. But instead, be patient and ask questions. I mean, literally, one of my favorite questions um, that my coach taught me, he'll say, well, what do you think is the one thing you should do here? And I'm like, I don't know. And he'll say, if you did know, what would the answer be? And Ooh. it's so crazy how that actually unlocks people. And I've done it with my kids. Well, if you did know the answer, Tyler, what do you think it would be? And it just gets them to spit out something that's on the bottom of their consciousness. So asking great questions, I think, is one way that I can help elevate the people that matter to me. That was awesome, Jay. I loved that. And, uh, you know, it reminds me, I read a book uh, called The Coaching Habit, and it was all about questions. Tame the advice monster is what he says, you know, yeah. hey, wh what's, the, you know, what's the real challenge here for you instead of saying, hey, guys, all right, just get your pen and paper out and I'm going to give you the 10 steps, right? And it's so powerful, whether you're a coach, whether you're a leader, a parent, just ask questions, allow people to, you know, have some shared uh, resolution here. Man, that is awesome. Is there any parting thoughts or words of wisdom that you'd share with Elevate Nation today, Jay? No. Um, I think I think we've hit on so many great notes. I mean, hopefully, if they've got that question and they don't know the answer, you know, what's the one thing they can do such that by doing everything else will be easier and necessary? I really do hope that they'll ask that question for themselves around something that matters. It's that time of year where a lot of us do a little bit of self-reflection, you know, 2020, I think a lot of us are ready for 2021, <laughs> but we're also asking like, who do I want to be in 2021? Stop and give some thought to the answer and then try to work it back to a really small, small thing that you can commit to every day. I think they might find that there's some real magic in that. Knock over one little domino and let the magic happen, my friend. That is so beautiful. Jay, this has been so much fun. Tell the listeners how they can learn more about you and what you do. Well, the good thing about a name like Jay Papazan is there's only one in the world. So if they want to find me, they can just Google me. They're going to find me. Um, I do my own social media. I'm not super attentive. Um, I'm there, but I don't like, don't expect an immediate answer. But the, the one thing.com with the number one is where all things around our training live. And there's tons of free resources. So I, that would be maybe the first place to go. Awesome. Jay, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we'll look forward to part two of this conversation in the future. Thank you, man. It's good to know you. Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. We will put links in the show notes of how you can get a hold of Jay and learn more about him and what he's doing. But my goodness, what a powerful discussion today. 
Uh, I don't know about you, but I learned so much and so much that I can apply. I mean, goodness, there's so much here. I mean, you're talking about stacking on top of ideas and, you know, building on ideas rather than just, you know, accepting something new and, and totally moving your life or whatever in whatever direction. I'd never heard it described in that way, but man, Jay is such a clear thinker and such a, such a great guy and such a, you know, giver of his talent, his time, his wisdom, uh, his thoughts. So really appreciated him coming on, but I encourage you to, to reach out to Jay, to read his books. I mean, especially the one thing, uh, it is a phenomenal read. And of course I've got the millionaire real estate investor right behind me as well, uh, written by him and, uh, his partner there, uh, Gary Keller. So uh, some massive, massive value today. So I encourage you to re-listen to this show. Of course, repetition is the mother of all skills. So go in there and re-listen and identify what are your top three distinctions? Uh, you know, what are you taking away and what are you stacking on other ideas with right now and uh, apply those to your life. But the most important thing, again, about applying to your life is the massive action. Take massive action. And uh, with all that said, I uh, really appreciate you listening again today. And we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you for listening to Elevate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to rate, review, subscribe, and pay it forward by sharing with a friend. Most importantly, take this opportunity to elevate your results by taking immediate action on what you learned. For more, visit elevatepod.com.